Dean, Amy, if you can lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before uh, we start with regular public comment this evening, everything on agenda, we just want to take a moment of silence and observance of the anniversary of Pearl Harbor this week, which is Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, seeing as the health district is not here, we'll uh, move into public comment. Um, anyone wishing to speak this evening in public comment? Tom? Could you skip the attendance? Can we hit? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Councilor Bellow? Here. <laughs> we'll Councilor Hammond? Here. <laughs> Councilor Hurley. Here. Councilor Latina. Here. Councilor Martino. Councilor Rell. Here. Councilor Spinella. Here. Deputy Mayor Barry. Here. And Mayor Montaner. Here. Thanks, Thor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Good evening, Tom Azarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. <clears throat> uh, MDC, my favorite subject. So just to refresh everybody's memory, we were here at the last meeting and we had a presentation by MDC, talked at length about Town of Wethersfield need to reserve uh, monies in case Hartford uh, fails to pay their water and sewer bill. A lot of good questions were asked and answered, lots of information about the uh, reserve money and how that would work and the intention to get that resolved in the legislature so it never really cost Weathersfield <coughs> any money. But needless to say, there was a lot of people that were in disagreement about the, the plan. Uh, there was an article in the current that had about four or five of the towns and they all voiced their disagreement with the proposal. Uh, the next day there was an emergency meeting for the vote and uh, one of the reasons we were told was that they wanted to get this plan in place so as not to have a negative effect on the bond rating that MDC was going out for. And I know, Paul, you made a comment about, you know, if the bond uh, rating goes unfavorable, and uh, we end up, or MDC ends up paying more money for the uh, infrastructure work that's going to be done. That we know, we know, we're never going to get that money back. There's no chance to recover that that increased in uh, bond cost. Well, what we didn't talk about that night was the four percent increase in water charges to Wethersfield residents and the six and a half percent increase in sewer charges. Uh, for Wethersfield residents. And that totals up to $11 million system-wide for MDC. And we're never going to get that money back either. So I was very really disappointed in the outcome. I was more disappointed in the vote. The vote was unanimous. Out of all these member towns, and I count 32 commissioners that are representing the various towns. Not one person voted against the proposal. Uh, Weathersfield had one person vote for the proposal. The other people evidently couldn't make it, maybe because it was a uh, early meeting that was uh, scheduled at the last minute, but for whatever reason, not one person voted no, but plenty of the towns had a disagreement about the proposal. So I was really uh, surprised at that. I don't know uh, what we can do to keep the costs down, but our costs keep going up in town. You know, the water bill used to almost be a non-bill. You know, you'd get your water bill every three months and, you know, it was $40, $50 or something like that. And nobody even paid attention. Well, I never paid attention to it, let's put it that way. 
So the last water bill I got was 222 or something. And now that's going to go up another 6%, uh, 6.5% on the sewer, 4% on the water. And uh, it's not going to be long before we're paying $1,000, $2,000 a year for water. I hope you guys all consider that when you start working on budgets. We have to come to a we have to come up with a way to keep the costs going from going up. I know uh, most people don't get a 6% increase in their salary every year. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Other members of the public wishing to speak this evening? Bob? Uh, good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. <clears throat> um, I, too, am very disappointed in our MDC uh, issue that's going on at this point. Uh, extremely concerned about the issue that Tom brought up that everybody voted, those who did vote for it. Yet the citizens, I think there's a lot of citizens out there that I'm hearing from that are pretty ticked off. Yet. I don't know if they're calling you, but I've, heard, I've got some calls, and then we've had some nice conversations about this. All we can say is it reflects back on our town council. Our town council is the ones that, that put these people that sit on the MDC board. You folks put them up there. <coughs> then they go and vote. It reflects right back on you, and I will hold you to that as we get into our budget season and as we get into any kind of budget increases. <clears throat> I find that uh, the MDC being a regional operation, and we keep hearing about we need to have regionalism. This is a reason why we don't need regionalism. This is where we have a small group of people, unelected officials, and many of them were elected officials before at one point, but they're not anymore, and here they are, creating a situation, uh, they're voting to increase our bills. And we all have to remember these people. When we see them on the street and anywhere else, you know, they're not, they're not to be left alone. They should be hammered for what they've done, voting for the MDC to put this extra burden on us just because they can't live within their means. So they ended up losing X amount of dollars, potentially, if Hartford doesn't pay. They should be like any other organization and just take it on the chin and reduce what their operations are and survive with it that way. But to do like at the town of Wethersfield or the town Hartford does, we just keep taxing people, we keep taxing people. And that's exactly what the MDC is doing. We're just not called a tax, but I think it's, it's definitely in that vein of taxation without representation. And then, of course, we have the state of Connecticut ready to implode. We have Hartford ready to implode. Why should we care, Mayor, and pony up to these people? Did we, did they come and consult us when they wanted to put Dunkin' Donuts Stadium in and spend all that money? Did they come and consult with us and ask us for our advice regarding Dillon Stadium that turns into a constant mess up there regarding money? Did they call us and ask us for all the different abatements that they gave and reduced their taxes. Did they come and ask us what we thought of that? But they're definitely coming now saying, well, we can't pay our bill. We need the rest of you folks to pay for it. Baloney. I keep hearing City of Hartford complaining, complaining about this in lieu of benefits. How many buildings, how many, 50% of their entire city is, 
and, and encumbered by properties that don't pay taxes. And I think not long ago, two years ago, when the state of Connecticut decided to buy the Connecticut River Valley, the Connecticut River buildings along the Connecticut River, those nice big red buildings next to the, just west of the 91, when they bought those buildings for X amount of dollars, now they, from a private company, they took them off the tax rolls. I didn't hear the city of Hartford say one, one word. Over on the, the corner the, uh, where the fork in the road is for Farmington Avenue and Asylum, just a few blocks in, that big building that Aetna owned is now a state of Connecticut building. I didn't hear the state of the Hartford uh, City Council complaining, or the mayor for that fact, that, oh, we're only going to get in lieu of benefits now. They didn't complain. Why not? They didn't care. They knew when things got tough, they're going to have to turn and, and we're going to end up ponying up for them. And we should not be doing that. State of Connecticut report just came out. What's it called? State of Connecticut OPM, other people's money, uh, fiscal, fiscal accountability report. And that's for 2017 to 2020. And one thing I'll bring up out of that whole report. Long-term obligations. We right now are looking at $74.3 billion that the state of Connecticut has for long-term obligations. I uh, have here somewhere, it's been jumping. I don't know where it is, but it increased over $2 <coughs> billion this past year. And last year, it was a three, $3 billion increase. Now, let's just think about this. $5 billion increase in our debt load. Our debt load is bonded indebtedness, state employee pensions, teachers' pensions, state employment post-retirement health and life. That's their insurance. Teachers insurance and of course that little old thing called gap little tiny piece but the fact remains 74.3 billion dollars we now owe when this guy they call a governor came on board mayor it was 60 billion it's increased 14 billion dollars when this guy what's his name Malloy when he came on, he has increased our debt, $14 billion. And what do we have to show? What do we have to show for $14 billion? We would have been better off not spending that $14 billion and living within his means, but instead it was borrow, borrow, borrow. And who's on the hook for it? <coughs> the people that own property in this state are on the hook for it, Mayor. And it's a pretty sad situation when we have somebody like that come in and, and he's given so much trust when in fact he's going to leave one heck of a mess behind. And, 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 it, and, and this is the same thing with the MDC is doing. Their, their $2.1 billion water project, is, I, I don't know. I've looked at some of those costs and some of those billings that they've got. I've done some research, and I just shake my head over what they're laying out. And, and no wonder we're in trouble. But I would, I would urge your, your, you, Mayor, to be on guard, because I think you hold a lot of responsibility. Because you put these people up at the MDC as commissioners. And, and, and they've now put us in a heck of a hole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Gus. Good evening. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Guess what? I missed it last time, but I came back. Oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, it's my voice. Uh, I have a problem. But anyway, uh, I'm not going to go away. I'm still waiting for some answers. <clears throat> you guys have told me that I got all the answers. I guess I got all the answers that you want to give me, but not all the answers that I'm asking to the question that I'm asking. So far to this date, and correct me if I'm wrong, the only answer that I got is that we have too many stop signs in town. And I do not have enough traffic, or we do not have tra enough traffic on our street to require another stop sign. Which I don't agree with that at all. Just the fact that there are too many stop signs in town doesn't have anything to do on Morrison Avenue where we need a stop sign. Uh, <clears throat> during, well, the report by the police was done before the reconstruction of the sidewalks. The police stated that basically when you approach Orchard looking towards Silas Dean, you cannot see very far. That's why there is a stop sign in the westbound direction on that intersection. When the town took the measurement, the intersection site distance for that particular leg is, uh, I believe, 290 feet. Before the reconstruction of the sidewalk, the intersectional site distance on Orchard looking west was, uh, I believe, 340 feet. At that particular time, there was no need for a stop sign. Since you guys have moved the road four or five feet to the south, we have rebuilt the sidewalk, you have constructed that wall and everything else. The intersectional site distance for that, as measured by the time, is 232 feet. It seems to me that 232 feet is much less than a 290. It was before. <coughs> Let me quote something now. This is uh, geometric design of highway and streets, and I have just uh, Exhibit 955, design intersection site distance, that basically for a design speed of 30 miles per hour, the intersection site distance should be 330 feet. Keep in mind now that the posted speed on Morrison Avenue is 25. The 25 miles per hour speed limit requires a intersection site distance for 275 feet. In that intersection, we have 232 feet. Something doesn't match it and nobody's doing anything. On a side point, you know why Trump wants? One, because you politicians right now, you are not listening to the people. <coughs> Let me continue on. Since the reconstruction, and I said that basically at one point that it was a poor design. Again, let me, let me quote right here the Ashto, Geometric Design of Highway and Streets, where it talks about the width of sidewalk, they should be between four and eight feet. Uh, the grass strip should be minimum two feet to whatever you can afford it. And then in one point it says, where sidewalks are placed adjacent to the curb, the width should be approximate two feet wider than those widths used when a planted strip separates the sidewalk <coughs> from the curb. And I brought this up before, but nobody cares. We have a four-foot sidewalk with a three-foot strip for most of the street, except when we get at the intersection of Tifton and Morrison. And what the town has done is create more of a problem for the handicap, has built a four-foot sidewalk a bituminous curbing in front of it, where there should be a concrete curbing, and a retaining wall on the other side. If you are in a wheelchair and you encounter somebody, you are you know, in the westbound or eastbound direction there, you don't even have enough room 
to bypass. Why, wh what are you going to stand? You've got to go on the road. You call this safety? I am amazed that nobody really questions it, too. I've been doing this kind of work for 37, 40 years, and I say that more than once there is no accountability or no care for the time. Give me an answer. Why? During the construction, or after the construction, I ask the question, why do the no parking signs are behind the sidewalk? That's the only place in town where I can see it. Why is the stop sign not between the curb and the sidewalk, but it's in the back of the sidewalk? I always joke around, says, to my friends, says, oh, no, 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 that does not pertain to the traffic. That pertains to the pedestrian. What have you done on that street? It's a complete disastrous thing. And by constructing the sidewalk on the north side of Morrison Avenue between Orchard and Tifton, that was the worst thing that the town could have done it. Now you're encouraging people to, to traffic the, the students and, at middle school to cross it right there where the intersection of side is not there and it's very dangerous. And if something happens, I will come back. But even if something doesn't happen, I will still come back. Thank you. Thank you. Others wishing to speak this evening? George? Is this the one? Is this the one? I don't know which no, one's the one. one. This one? Okay. George A. Rowe, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I gotta start with a bit of humor. Unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, I gotta practice once in a while, and I like to come down and practice these skills here and see if I can still remember what to say without a lot of notes in front of me. Okay. I really appreciated the the, uh, the mayor's moment of silence to Pearl for the Pearl Harbor incident. As I look around this room, there's not a one of you was there at that time, with the possible exception of Jack Bradley. Maybe. <laughs> and I'm not sure about him. <laughs> but it was, it was a period of time that became a defining moment in my life and how I look at government. And much of what people say here is warranted. And I've been down here complaining about a lot of stuff. <clears throat> but I wish my concerns, my real concerns about government these days, were centered about the town of Wethersfield vis-a-vis -vis our federal government. That scares me. With that said, I would like to just comment very briefly on the meeting that we had last week relative to the pond, which occupied a lot of my time here for many, many years. I wanted to make a presentation, but the manager said no, but I was only kidding. I had a box, pretty big box full of stuff. <laughs> and so we joked and laughed about it. But on the positive side, I really wanted to share, I feel very comfortable with the plan that has been proposed by uh, Derek and the manager which was presented. I looked at it carefully. My great-grandson came over and looked at it and said, what is that? And I went over a lot of numbers because I'm trying to get it. He's pretty smart. And I said, you've become an engineer. You'll be able to handle all these numbers that are on there. And he read a lot of them, and we had a lot of fun on it. So from that perspective, a very positive. I also felt positive about the fact that the, both the manager and Derek were able to focus in on the issue, which is the pond, which was a long saw and a thorn in my side, all right? And it appears to me that that is come, will be brought to fruition or brought to completion in the, in the reasonably foreseeable future. And when I say focus on the specific problems, that wasn't the kind of stuff that someone's worrying about a street not being completed because it made to me, a lot of sense to leave that street go until this project was done. Or to divert from the real problem and talk about occasional flooding that does take place from time to time and people get a little splashed when they walk in their dog. So, so and without 
being specific or picking on my neighbors, but I'm glad the people in charge were able to focus in on the real problem. So I, I just wanted to share those particular positive thoughts. In terms of the budget, yeah, I hope you watch it and try to control spending. I hope that as a group, all of our elected local officials can look at all of the nitty gritty costs that are associated with running local government. I think a very careful look at what, what I see as one of the greatest sources of overtime pay, and I'm not gonna go into it beyond that, but to be brought a bit more under control. And to be concerned about spending money on or not spending many dollars on items that are make you feel good type things, but will really enhance the community in small ways like the pond or in larger ways that we can make Wethersfield a better town to live in. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you, George. Any other public comment this evening? I have a letter I'd like to read. Yes, please. Tommy Monstream, 357 Garden Street. For years, this town has implored its citizens to partake in the beautification of the town. The garden clubs of Wethersfield have stepped up with landscaping, maintaining small corner or pocket gardens, including planning, planting, investing time, money, energy, and passion to welcome tourists and enhance the general look of the town. <laughs> what a crying shame that without so much as a fare thee well, the town tears up a beautiful neighborhood garden that had graced the intersection of Hartford Avenue, Knott Street, and State Street for many years. <clears throat> if a sidewalk is necessary to cross from Hartford Avenue to Cove Park on State Street, it could have been done without tearing up years of work and loving care. The sidewalk installed was mostly where asphalt was painted for a walkway and minimally reduced the garden. How pleasant it would be to walk through this intersection and enjoy a beautiful garden. <clears throat> the town was very successful in preserving the lovely garden on Main Street and Church Street and Marsh intersection. Why not give each garden and the loyal gardeners the same treatment and respect? What a terrible disappointment to Sheila Wells and Betty Standwich who put years of effort, physical effort, time and money into this project to have it removed practically overnight. I hope this town can do a kinder, more considerate job in the future. The value of the beauty and let not the car be king. Thank you. Thank you. We did coordinate that project with Betty Standish. They knew what we were doing, they approved what we were doing and we did it. So that was not a spur of the moment thing. That was designed through the engineering department in full collaboration with the beautification committee. So. But it was very sudden. Because we, really was. I understand, but we did reach out to the beautification committee and we did talk to Betty and we did coordinate what we were gonna do and how we were gonna do it and what the final outcome would be. So it wasn't without communication, it wasn't spur of the moment. So I understand. And next spring when it's planting season, we'll get back in there and clean that up. But because we had the contractor on site and the sidewalk projects that we wanted to do this fall, and it was this, the new engineer thought it was a safety issue, we got in there and did it this year. We could have probably saved a lot of that garden. Again, that was all coordinated with Betty, and we'll... I don't, I don't understand that. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Thank you. Uh, council reports. Any council reports this evening? More council Do one. Anybody here? Oops. No council reports? Are you guys Just work comments. anymore? <laughs> 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 I know. It was Thanksgiving. Everybody had a cup of so nothing there. Okay. Council comments? 
Tony. A <laughs> uh, couple of different things. <clears throat> Start off with last Friday, uh, there was an open house at the Transition Academy down on Silestine, which opened this year for the first time. Uh, the students were there dressed up, uh, there to greet the parents and, and the guests that they brought, uh, board staff, uh, council members, and board of education members that show up. Uh, the place is really nice inside. I had been there about a month or so ago, and since that time, they've done a lot more. Uh, they got a lot of paintings and stuff on the wall, and uh, one particular wall where they have a setup. It's a great collage of stuff that I, I told them that they should uh, take a picture of and put online uh, to really advertise what they're doing down there. But, uh, the kids are really excited to be there and uh, happy, and uh, I think it's a great thing for the town that we did down there. Uh, also, last this past week, a bunch of council members were down at uh, Main Street last Thursday for holiday in Maine, and I'd like to thank the chamber for the great event that was put on down there that night. And then lastly, uh, today, uh, the mayor, Council Rall, and myself were at Eversource. Uh, George, you'll be interested in this one. Uh, there was a seminar on racial profiling that was put on. The guest speaker was uh, a Dr. Um, Johnson from Dolan Consulting Group. Uh, he did a very nice presentation, and basically what happened is a lot of reports done in the past have been done using uh, the number of stops, whatever, based and coming up with a benchmark based on census of the towns. And he emphasized that this is the wrong way to do it. It shouldn't be based on census. It should be based on things like taking um, vehicle accident reports and including within those keeping track of uh, race and ethnicity to come up with a benchmark and comparing that against the number of stops. And by doing that, he used a couple of good examples. Uh, one was a suburb just south of uh, Detroit, and he showed a few other major cities the differences. And by doing it off of a comparison of accident reports, which are the people that are driving versus the total census, which doesn't include everybody that drives, that the benchmarks and the actual stops were in line racially, and it wasn't you know, profiling or bad that turned out. It was very interesting. And uh, I think I've covered it, but uh, Mike or the mayor, any other thoughts on that or comments? Yeah. Well covered, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> any other council reports? Okay. Jeff, anything? Uh, do you, did you want me to go over there? There's more scenario. Yeah, yeah, I think right. we should. I, do it. I got a presentation. Um, while you set up, we'll just see if Dolores has anything. I get it. No, tonight we uh, swore in some of our justices of the peace, which will take uh, effect in January for the next, this January for the next four years, uh, and some of the uh, others. Tonight we swore in justices of the peace for the town, and they will be taking over in January and running through for four years to the following December. A couple other items as I set up. Um, we did have a bond rating uh, last week in anticipation of $8.5 million for the Wethersfield High School last tranche of bonds. Our rating was stable at AA plus with S&P. Uh, so we'll be closing on the bonds uh, later this week. The sale takes place later this week. Um, at the last meeting, there was a question on the Cuisenberry or Harry bill as it relates to the track. That portion of the track project was not pursued by the board of or by the building committee, so that those funds will not be spent on the architect. So that'll lapse. And then we had a meeting. When I say we, the town engineer and I had a meeting with Goodwin College. They are pursuing an expanded trail system through the meadows. They own many of the parcels down in the meadows now. So they received a grant from the state of Connecticut to uh, continue their trail project. So they anticipate over the next two years to develop and enhance the trail system through the meadows. So I thought that was pretty positive. Yes. So 
quick comment um, or question. Will they be consulting the Weather Street Game Club yes, for safety they, purposes? Yes, they work okay. with the Game Club now all the time. Okay. Yeah, they've got a good relationship with both the Game Club <coughs> and the uh, Trust, the Great Meadows Trust. Yep. So. Okay. All right, I'm looking what we're going to talk about. Uh, some of the newer council members and some of the older council members have asked me to kind of put together <coughs> I can find it here. There it is. kind of the history on Morrison Avenue and where this town has been and its conversation about Morrison Avenue. So I've worked with the police department and the uh, engineering department to go over uh, what we've accomplished or what's been done in the recent future and we go back to 1997 which is the first study that was done uh, by then uh, Chief Karen Jekis, Lieutenant James Mull of the Weatherfield Police Department okay so this was a request for a stop sign on Morrison <coughs> Avenue at Orchard and the request was for a stop sign to slow people down that was the nature of the request um, the traffic survey was done. There was four to 600 cars a day. Uh, the accident report showed that there was one accident in the uh, short term prior to this, and that was where a car backed out of a driveway and parked into a parked car, uh, backed into a parked car on the opposite side of the street. The conclusion of the study was the number of vehicles using Morrison Avenue is not indicative of a stop sign control issue inclement weather only increases hazards at stop sign intersections having negative approach slopes and stop signs are not meant to control speed okay it later goes on to talk about wanting children at children playing signs and then the request for a one-way street on morrison avenue at that time the study did not recommend either one of those two options the next study is in February 1st, 2008. I can open this up. Um, Mr. Alpert of Morrison Avenue asked for, a, again, a stop sign at Orchard to slow speed down. And this is the response to Mr. Alp Alpert. Okay. So in this particular instance, four traffic studies were conducted. One on six days in April of 2007, three days in June of 2007, five days in July of 2007, and five days in January 2008. Um, the data was, did not indicate a speed problem. And then the police officer, I think it was Lieutenant Power, um, yes, Lieutenant Power goes through the manual of uniform traffic control devices on when a stop sign is warranted. During a stop sign is warranted during an interim period while awaiting the installation of a traffic signal, an accident problem as indicated by five or more reported accidents of a type susceptible correction by a multi-way stop sign, minimum traffic volumes, the minimum vehicular volume entering the intersection from the major street approaches total of both approaches averages at least 300 vehicles per hour for any eight hour of an, ex of an average day. The combined vehicular and pedestrian volume for minor street approaches total of both approaches averages at least 200 units per hour for the same eight hours with an average delay to minor street vehicular traffic of at least 30 seconds per vehicle. When the 85th percentile approach speed of the minor of the major street traffic exceeds 40 miles per hour the minimum vehicular volume warrants 70% of the above requirements. None of those warrants were met in February of 2008. So the response was at the time that no stop sign is warranted. Okay. Then we go into the May, 2000, May 21st, 2009 study. And this was a request from then town manager Bonnie Therrien to the police department to do another study at Tifton or Orchard and the reason again was to slow the traffic down uh, on this particular study the, and I'm quoting from the middle of the page actually two-thirds of the way down the page the following items are good 
are quoted directly from the manual of uniform traffic control devices. Stop signs should not be used for speed control. Stop signs should be installed in a manner that minimizes the number of vehicles having to stop at intersections where a full stop is not necessary at times. Consideration should be given to using less restrictive measures such as yield signs. Once the decision has been made to install a two-way stop control, the decision regarding the appropriate street to stop should be based upon engineering judgment. In most cases, the street carrying the lowest volume of traffic should be stopped, and there's a stop sign at both Orchard and Tifton as they enter Morrison Avenue now. Stop signs should not be installed in the major street unless justified by a traffic engineering study. Okay. So again, we go through the traffic analysis and it repeats the traffic analysis that was taken in the prior study in 2008. And then they did some enforcement. If you look at this paragraph here, additional, additionally officers from the police department performed selective enforcement on Morrison Avenue in October 2008 during the morning and evening rush hours. During the period beginning October 21st, 2008 and lasting through October 31st, 2008, officers performed selective enforcement a total of 14 times lasting a total of six and a half hours, six and three quarter hours. During nine of these times, there was no speeding violations observed. During the other five times, the following enforcement actions were taken. Five verbal warnings for speed, one written warning for speed, and two infractions were issued for speed. Then it goes on to again to quote the conditions under which a stop sign would be warranted and none of those in 2009 were met. And that was prepared by Lieutenant Power. And again, the conclusion was Morrison Avenue at Orchard and Tifton fails to meet the manual of uniform traffic control device warrants, and he does not recommend a stop sign. And that was in 2009. Then we get into the January 12th study, which is where they took a dish, where they used the stealth stat machine to take the traffic volume numbers. Uh, this is Lieutenant Crabtree at the time, the stealth stat speed detection device was positioned on Morrison Avenue in the area of 18 Morrison Avenue. The radar was programmed to capture data for both eastbound and westbound traffic. Again, based upon the results of this study, the warrants were not met for a stop sign. Then we get into the site distance analysis. Now in 2012, we reconstructed the street, or excuse me, we reconstructed the sidewalk. And let's talk about that for a minute because the sidewalk originally started, and let me get to this a little bit here. Here is kind of a roster of all the meetings and all the communications that took place with the neighborhood for the Morrison Avenue sidewalk project. Started in 2007, and it concluded with town staff and the council putting together a dozen different scenarios for alignment of this street. It was narrowed down to two basic alignments or two basic designs. The neighborhood was invited in, all I think 24 residents, and they were asked to vote on which one they wanted. The basic difference <coughs> was sidewalks on both sides or sidewalk on one side. A majority of the residents voted for the design we have today. Now, I admit it was one vote went one way. That was what it was. It was 50% plus one on the vote. But every resident had a say in it. Every resident voiced their opinion. So we built what we have out there today. And as you can see, all the interactions we had during the project. Now, after the project, there was still an issue of the site distance. So the then town engineer, Mike Turner, went out and did a site distance analysis after the construction. And what he says in this memo is there are two different types of site distance issues. One is the stopping site distance. What is the distance a driver can safely stop when he sees an obstruction in the road? Okay, stopping site distance. Now on Morrison Avenue, heading east, the stopping site distance is 380 feet. Okay? Our subdivision regulations require Ashto requires 215, um, and there's a reference in here to our subdivision regulations. Uh, 
Standard Road, according to Ashto. Anyway, our sub, this 380 feet also exceeded our subdivision regulations. Then he gets into the intersectional site distance, which means when you're on Tifton looking at Morrison up and down the hill, what do you see? And Mr. Kahn told me he's exactly correct. At 15 feet back from the intersection, you are at 240 feet of intersectional site distance. However, at 10 feet back from the intersection, you are at 340 feet adequate for the intersection. That's the determination of the town engineer at the time and continue to be the opinion. So we answered that question of intersectional site distance post construction. Okay. Then we go into August 11, 2015 study. We did another study in August of 2015. Again, using the traffic monitoring systems we have, this August 2, uh, 2015 study actually showed that the traffic was slower now on that road than it had been in the past. So that's where we are. Our last study was in August of 2015. We've studied this quite significantly over time. Um, and here's a picture. Let me see if I can. Here's a picture. If you're at Tifton looking up the hill, this is what you see. Now, the retaining wall that was mentioned, we rebuilt that during the construction. The property owner there asked the town to help them rebuild that because they weren't going to let us take it out because a portion of it was on their property and a portion was on the right of way. So we rebuilt that. We also participated in building a handicap ramp because the person at the time living in that house had accessibility issues. So we built or aided in the built construction of a concrete handicap ramp to the house. Because if you, I don't have it, this is just PDF, but if you look at the driveway and the walkway, you can't get to the house, inside the house, from the Tifton side of the street. You can only get into the house from, the, or accessible from the Morrison Avenue side of the street. So all these ramps and everything were redone, but this is what you see looking left at Tifton. 10 feet back, 240 feet, or excuse me, 10 feet from the intersection, 380 feet, 15, or 15 feet back, you're at 240 feet. Based upon the engineering analysis and, and the Weathersfield Police Department analysis, this street, this intersection, does not warrant under the federal guidelines that we have to follow a stop sign. If it did, believe me, we'd put one up. <laughs> There'd no, be no reason not to. But this goes back now, where are we, almost 20 years, this analysis? So that's kind of the history on that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions from council for Jeff? <coughs> Anybody? Have you ever quantified how much all of this costs to do? No. We routinely do stop sign studies. We routinely, uh, I don't think there's an intersection in town that in our 375 years we've not done this analysis. And I'm sure we update them periodically as new residents come in and new uh, police officers and new conditions warrant. So we've never really calculated that, but I can say that we've studied this road probably more than others in town. Thank you, Jeff. I um, appreciate that. I know Mr. Colantonio has raised questions about this topic pretty steadily over the last several years, and I asked you to give this report. So for the benefit of the public, since it has been said many times that, A, we don't care, we don't have the information, and we haven't answered his questions, I think, again, it's important to note that these studies, which are available to him or any member of the public, in my opinion, answer every one of those questions and also validate why this council cannot act on that request any further. Thank you. Just one more point on, this, on the parking sign <coughs> issue. We did put them on the back side of the sidewalk because the snow shelf is narrow. It, everybody knew it was narrow going in. And if we put them in the snow shelf, when we plow snow, we're going to knock them over onto the sidewalk. 
So we put them on the back side of the sidewalk, still within the town right away, but they, we got them out of the way of the snow clouds. That's basically why they're there. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on to council action while Jeff uh, finishes up the screen. I believe we have one removal from the board. S Steve? A uh, motion to accept the removal of Shirley Steinmetz, uh, 375 Brimfield Road from the Human Rights and Relations Commission, effective 12-5-2016. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. No one finished business. Uh, we're going to move into business 3A. Make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding for the Clean Energy Commission grant. Second. Motion and second. Jeff? Yes, Mr. Mayor and Council, thank you. When we reaffirmed the, the pledge to participate in the Clean Energy Program, it reopened up a window of grant funding that uh, originally had been proposed to add solar panels to the roof of the community center. However, when that project was undertaken and initially uh, evaluated, the power systems at the community center weren't compatible with those panels. So that was put on hold for some time. And now we have proposed a new project where we'll replace the boilers and if possible, some of the lighting at the nature center to have more efficient systems there. Thank you. Questions for Jeff on this? Mike Grell. Do we have a cost, how much it costs to operate uh, the nature center? Uh, we can get that. We keep separate accounts for power and Okay. Sense. Yeah. Would That's you like great. that? Please. Sure. Other questions from council for Jeff on this? <coughs> Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Uh, there are no bids. <coughs> and we're going to move into 5A. For introduction. Yeah, that's an introduction for the repeal, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. That doesn't require any action. Good. Get a motion to approve the minutes of November 21st. We did make a correction on uh, page 10 in the spelling of Cuisenberry. Thank you. Make a motion to approve the meeting minutes from November 21st, 2016. Second. Any additional changes or modifications, Council? Jody? I just have a quick clarification. Um, Dolores, on page three, the very first sentence, um, I think you were quoting me when I was having a back and forth with MDC, and I just wanted to be clear that it should say when they, meaning Hartford, because I think it says when you. I'm sorry, on page three? Page three, first sentence. You would be reimbursed down the road. I'm sorry. And what was the, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Jody. Is modified, we have a motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? I abstain. Thank you, Amy. Public comment. Gus? Good evening again. Again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Wow, that was awesome, huh? All of the reasons that they were expressed in there for not having a stop sign on Morrison Avenue, apply equally well on Hillcrest. And I know I have heard it. The stop sign on Hillcrest Avenue, they've been there for a long time and we're not gonna remove it. The fact still remains. Originally, the town took some intersectional side distance and they came up with dimensions. 
those dementias did not work for them. So they have reduced. The way I say, you scooch up closer to the intersection so you can see more. Is that the way? I guess we can move or we can adjust the standards any way we want it to make it work. The fact still remains that in 1955, Morrison Avenue did not connect it to Silas Dean, and it did not have any true traffic. Right now, it's twice as many cars on Hillcrest Avenue. And, and, and you put a machine for the speed. Why didn't you put the machine closer to the intersection instead of very close to the intersection of Walker Hill and Morrison? Only in number two of the house. It's not even one third done. If you turn from Walker Hill and Morrison Avenue, when do you really speed up? As soon as you get to Morrison Avenue or maybe done? So those speed limits, I can assure you, I've been there for over 40 years now, the speed limits, the, the, the people go much higher than what it is now. And when they took it at 31 miles per hour, it's still, the 85th percentile is still much more than 25 miles per hour, which is posted. That's a that's bunch of, of a lot of maneuvering. The retaining wall, it was not really all the way up the way it is now. In fact, I saw it now again. I mean, again, I see it every day. There is no room between the curbing and the wall. If there is, if there is basically somebody on a wheelchair, you cannot bypass it. The guidelines are guidelines. It says if you have a four-foot sidewalk normally with a strip of grass in front of it, if you go with that sidewalk in front of it next to the, the road, you should go to six. Why wasn't that built like that or designed like that? Originally, it was built with one foot grass strip, one foot grass strip. Try to grow some grass strip or grass. And when you take into consideration the curbing, you don't have any soil at all to grow grass. A lot of what you heard tonight, I guess, you know, they are just excuses. I'm going to be coming right here until something really happens to Hillcrest Avenue because why do they have three, why do they have three stop signs and I have two? And why did they take a measurement of saying 232 feet? To 240, it's what I measured. The town measured 232 feet. And now, like, you know, you, say, you scooch up to, to, to be able to see it. That's not the way you design a road. And I tell you, that road is much, much more dangerous right now than it ever was before. Other public comment? Bob? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd just like to follow up on a, a few things that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, one about the city of Harford. Uh, there was the article about uh, the bankruptcy was a bad, uh, the, the mayor says that bankruptcy is a bad, bad for their image up in Harford. And uh, he says that he would prefer to address the city's debt through tax increase and regionalization. I, I hope when he's saying tax increase, he means taxing his own people not taxing us, but evidently we're, we're, we're going to be collateral damage in, into that whole bad episode. And again, it backs up to not one of our guys voted no. They all voted yes. That's, that's sad. That's sad how little, and, and they weren't even elected officials that voted. But they voted, and their vote meant more tax. Do help Harford out, and I think that's wrong. Um, I mentioned a few a little when I was up here before about the liabilities or the long-term debts. In 2014, the it was reported in that same OPM report that uh, the long-term debt was 68.4 billion dollars. I was in. November of 2014. November of 2015, it was 71.1. That was a $2.7 billion increase. 2015 to 16, which is the, the latest report that came out, 
It was $74.3 billion now. That was an increase of $3.2 billion. In total, in just those two years, it's $5.9 billion, almost $6 billion increase in the course of two years of our long-term debt at the state capitol. And, 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 and it, it, of course, it's, it's an array of reasons why, but also all the spending, all these grants that we keep asking for, um, <coughs> it's all coming out of there. And, and who's going to pay for it? And who's going to be stuck paying for it? Then, of course, in the Hartford Current, uh, there was uh, an article, it was an op-ed by uh, James Smith, the chairman of, and CEO of the Webster Bank, where he talked about, the, in 1991, more than 80% of the Connecticut voters favored a constitutional amendment imposing a cap on annual increases in state spending, uh, the keystone in a grand bargain that ushered in Connecticut's income tax. And with that income tax, our, our taxes have increased. The Constitution amendment to hold uh, the increases down has never been, hap has never happened for 25 years. And look where we are today, folks, because of spending that was just out of control, an income tax that came in and, and took so much cash out of people's pockets. And, and, and now the state of Connecticut is up the hock for $74 billion in long-term liabilities. And 14 of that just occurred with our mayor, with our governor up here in the state of Connecticut. The, uh, what's his name, Malloy. He's the one that brought us up, up, up to that higher level. And, and the folks should, in, in town and all over should, should really remember that. And hopefully he doesn't run for election again. But what, what Mr. Smith also says was the, the spending cap definition needs to be, remain true to three principles of fiscal responsibility. That's stability, predictability, and competitiveness. Do we have competitiveness in Connecticut? Heck no. Do we have predictability of our revenues? Heck no. Do we have stability? Stability's out the window. Thank you very much. We have a disgusting government here. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to speak? George? Good evening again. George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. Man, I, I'm really getting old. I tell you. But where it really comes to me is as I sit in the audience here, I, I beg your pardon, sitting in the public segment of our run of our town government, not the audience, we're not audience, <coughs> is to be able to hear what you people say. You know, I you know, I hate I don't want to be negative. I although I can. I think a little effort ought to be made to try to improve how the people here as well as the people at home can better hear what you people say. After a while, if you're a cynic, you'll say they mumble because they don't want anybody to hear what they're saying. Then I don't really think that that's the case. But the technology to make your voices heard here and at home is not rocket science. You know, and I, I really would encourage you to do something about it. I come home and my wife says, I couldn't hear a word they said. Now, granted, she's old like me and doesn't hear maybe as well, but she's got the thing turned full blast, and it's impossible to hear. And we, we talk about the little things that make life in, in town comfortable and better and well. And, and if you can't hear, you just turn the TV off, and nobody pays attention to what's happening. Just a, a little side remark, okay? Uh, I was very interested in Tony's comments on the, uh, the racial profiling study. And all of you know why I'm interested in that. I've become very conscious. Of, of this whole issue. And again, as one reads the papers and one reads what's happening countrywide, one cannot be anything but concerned about police across the country seem to be doing stuff that's less than the most desirable thing to do. 
And I tried to get a copy of the second study. I got a copy of the first one. I had anticipated that I might get one here. Jeff very graciously gave me the thing on the website, but a couple of hundred pages. You know, I can't sit down on my computer all day when my little grandsons, great grandsons running around. You know, you gotta look at a paper, you look at pieces and bits of it, you highlight it, some of it you skip. It's tough to do on a computer, especially when you're not as computer savvy as me. I'd like to maybe sit down with you, Tony, and maybe give me a rundown and see what, what happened. I was not aware of this meeting. I don't know how publicly it advertised it was. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But it's, it's an area of ongoing interest. And I'll tell you, it's, some, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area of concern to me. I ain't gonna be around if you suffer from this. But I will have heirs that will be. And I really am very much concerned about that. Okay, so I just wanna share. I'd like to sit down and chat with you and, okay. and just see where we go, Tony, on this. The, uh, the only other thing that I did forget, and maybe I should make more notes when I read, is uh, uh, on election day, I took it upon myself and visited all of the polling sites. And I bumped into Tony and a couple, and I bumped into Russ Meyer and a couple. And at one point I said, who's following who? Am I following you, Russ, or are you following me? But I wanted to share with you what my observations were. As I, as I had previously commented, the concern that I had prior to election was not in the, in the integrity of the vote, what was taking place once you checked in. I had no concerns about that, the fact that in our town and probably in Connecticut, that is not an issue. The thing that concerned me is the check-in process. And the check-in process, apparently, as one paid attention to what's happening countrywide, there were lines and lines and lines and lines. Once you got past the lines and got in, the, the process probably went well. That can only say one thing. There's some level of incompetency or indifference or something involved in the check-in process. And I know if people were added to, in, 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 to improve the process, the, the checking in, and, uh, and, and, and that's a first step. But if you've got a, a system of questionable, I don't want to use the word integrity, but effectiveness, where you got stuff in loose leaf books and you're rummaging through loose leaf books, vis-a-vis -vis on a big sheet and you just you zip yourself through to, to move people into the process. Once you're past there, there's hardly any lines. And, and, that, and I sat and watched a while after I voted. And I got vo voted early. But it took me about a minute and a half to get checked in. And then I sat and watched a while and I watched other people checking in. And there was conversation going on between the, the, the voter and the, the, the checker and what disturbed me and concerned me more than anything was the conversation between the officials at the election site and the non-official checkers. And as I told my wife, they ask you a question, ignore them. Just don't tell them anything. But these, I saw delays taking place there. And when you have thousands of people voting, a delay of a half a minute in time adds up. And I think, and I'm sharing my experience as a moderator, and Dolores knows I was one for many, many years. I never let those checkers, those unofficial checkers, anywhere near my checkers. They sat behind them. If they got the data, they got it. If they didn't get it, that's too bad. The purpose only is for the parties. And that's all right they have, and I think they should exercise that to see how their particular constituents, whether they're coming out or voting or not. But if they miss one or two, it doesn't make a doggone bit of difference. But so I would share again that, and I did this publicly here. I did not go down and sit down and get into discussion with the, uh, with the um, registrars of with yeah the registrars of voters, because I figured I'd share it however it gets there, and putting extra bodies on is fine, but just putting extra bodies there and using a system that's still less than desirable or less than effective. You know, it's, it's an exercise, it's, it's not the most desirable thing to do. So the good news was everything once you got in worked fine, in my opinion, it worked very efficiently, but that check-in process, and that has always been an area of concern, even when I was a moderator. And that requires a tremendous amount of integrity on the part of the moderator in charge, and to make sure that the checkers understand what their roles are. And as I called attention to a number of things at the polling site where I was, 
that should have been taken care of by the, by the moderator in terms of sign postings and, and things of that type? Oh, I didn't know that. I never checked them. I didn't even see these signs. And in some of the voting districts, as you would approach them, I happen to know where they are. But many people really don't even know where they're supposed to vote. There were no signs on the street saying, hey, vote here. There were little eight and a half by 11 signs thrown together and say, vote here. There ought to be some way that as we look ahead to be able to make sure that uniformity throughout the town in terms of signage, vote here, what district is involved, and to make sure that the signs that say the 75 feet mark are adequate, and I did not see violations of that 75-foot uh, uh, lobbying activity in my polling place or the others that I visited. That I did not see. But the, the absence of signs, whether it's there or not, is, is almost incidental. The signage ought to be there. So I just share those thoughts with you. For whatever they're worth, for this old goat. And maybe I'll never vote again. I may have never, I'll never vote again at a, at a presidential election. Who knows? You know? I am in my life. I'm lucky I make it here once in a while. Okay, folks, take care. Thank you. Jim? Jim Clinch, 903 Ridge Road. Uh, Councillor uh, Spinella and I were pleased to see that the town made the right move and they terminated the uh, principal. I thought it was uh, the right move to do. The uh, second thing is that the, uh, uh, the police department had a tragic thing happen with the dog. They lost their dog. It's a very, very sad, tragic story if you're an animal lover. And... Uh, I, I, I think, I'm not sure, I'm just talking off the top of my head now. I think that they have a ceremony tomorrow morning at the community center. Thursday. 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 Oh, Thursday. Thursday yeah. at 9 o'clock. That's it. Thank 10 to you. 2. 10 to 2. 10 to Thank 2. you. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so we're done with public comment, I can see. Um, Get a motion to go in executive session to discuss pending litigation pursuant to Connecticut General Statute Section 1209C and personnel matters. We'll make that motion. You got a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you.